The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. If you don't know the name Lee Miracle, tonight you'll learn why you should. The trailblazing Indigenous author and teacher died last month, and tonight we revisit the significance of her works and her influence on generations that followed. Then, Indigenous leaders were to head to the Vatican for a meeting with the Pope. That's been delayed suddenly due to the new Omicron variant. But earlier this month, we spoke to a former head of the Assembly of First Nations, Phil Fontaine, about why that meeting has significance for us all. It's Tuesday, December 7th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. Few people leave the kind of legacy that award-winning writer, poet, mentor, and teacher Lee Miracle does. In addition to her many works of fiction and non-fiction, she cut the path for Indigenous writers and academics who would come after her. She stood up to the Canadian literary establishment to get her first book published in the mid-1970s and never after shied away from exposing the grievous treatment of Indigenous people in this country. Her last novel was called Celia's Song. With us now to remember Lee Miracle, who died last month, we're joined in Sudbury, Ontario, by author and journalist Wabgisha Grice. His latest novel was called Moon of the Crusted Snow, and a sequel is currently in the works. And here in Ontario's capital city, Tanya Talega, author of Seven Fallen Feathers, which won the RBC Taylor Prize, and most recently, All Our Relations, which she delivered as the 2018 Massey Lectures. She's a columnist at the Globe and Mail. And playwright, novelist, journalist, and television scriptwriter Drew Hayden Taylor. His 35th book, a novel called Chasing Painted Horses, was just published this fall. You know, I better do a fact check on that. Are you working on 35 now, Drew, or was that number 35? I'm working on 35 right now. That was like 32, I think. Okay, either way, that's a ridiculous number, but uh, good for you anyway. Uh, let's start off. First of all, thanks, everybody, for joining us here on TVO tonight. And let's start off by reading a few quotes from others about Lee Miracle, and then we'll get you into the discussion. Every Indigenous writer walks in her footsteps. That's what Anishinaabe writer and University of Manitoba professor Negan Sinclair said on Twitter. I would not be where I am without her, Métis author Katharina Vermette said in the Globe and Mail. Lee was our auntie. She looked out for us and fought for us, always. This woman stormed to the stage to be heard. She insisted on her place and brought us all along behind her, whether we wanted to or not. No one said no to Auntie. She was before the reckoning, Daniel Justice, a professor of Indigenous literature at the University of British Columbia said. She was one of the voices that helped herald the reckoning and was ceaseless in her commitment to that. Okay, those are some other descriptions of Lee Miracle. I want to hear yours. Drew, start us off. Well, I'm uh, one of those privileged few and many that actually knew her on a very personal level. I knew her as a friend. I actually knew her as a friend before I was well-versed in her writing style. I also knew her as an actress. Not many people know she uh, she uh, appeared in several of my plays. She was a wonderful, versatile talented, opinionated, strong woman. I'm running out of adjectives here, but there are more adjectives to describe who she was. And I, you know, they say, and I, I it's such a cliche, but I do honestly 100% believe the world is a much less interesting place and much more boring place now without her. Hmm. Tanya, happy to hear some more adjectives from you. <laughs> Um, well, I think the most important one is that Lee was my friend, and it was um, it was unbelievably upsetting to hear of her passing, um, knowing what she's done for so many of us, so many Indigenous writers, so many women, Indigenous women authors. She, as Katrina said, she stormed the stage. She blew open the doors for us, and as Daniel said as well it was before the reckoning before people really understood you know she was a force of nature she could just 
the power of her words. I mean, if you've ever seen her speak, if you've ever seen her take on a question from somebody at the end of a speech, um, when someone asks something mildly racist, because we get that all the time as an Indigenous <laughs> author and you're standing, you know, on a stage and someone asks something or says something and she could bring someone down like nobody's business, but do it in a really thoughtful, smart strong-handed way um and nobody ever said no to auntie that's so true i mean if lee miracle called you and told you to get over to her house or to come pick her up you did it <laughs> you know and you did it happily because you know and you knew that whatever she where she was going whatever she was doing was really important and you also needed to be there with her well Gishik, what would you add to that well, I would add that she was unrelenting in many ways. She was unwavering in her passion for her people and her stories and also for the rest of the storytellers that she made space for. You know, she was a massive presence in any room that she inhabited. Uh, but on the other hand, she was also very caring, very considerate, and she would always ensure that those of us who came up after her uh, felt empowered and felt comfortable in these often hostile and foreign places. And everyone has said she has been like an auntie. She is very much a literary matriarch. And coming from a res, you know, I have been dependent and reliant upon aunties, grandmother figures, and so on. And to come uh, off the res and into the city and into these literary spaces and to have someone like her there for me, um, I wouldn't have accomplished what I have without her presence uh, and without her uh, just kind and compassionate spirit uh, that has really held me up since the beginning. Well, the New York Times, not every day to be sure, does an obituary on somebody from this country who dies and, um, and yet the New York Times did an obit on Lee Miracle, and it described her, interestingly enough, as combative. Although, and I'm hearing some of that in the responses that you three just gave, but if you look at pictures of her, and we'll put some up right now, she's almost always got a smile or a laugh on her face. Drew, what's that about? <laughs> well, I have to say, one of the most defining uh, features of uh, Lee Miracle was her laugh. Yes. You could find her in the middle mm -hmm. of a 100 kilometer wide um, uh, hurricane just by her laugh. She was quick to laugh, <laughs> she was eager to laugh. She loved the world, she loved humor, she loved everything that, that, that was amusing, which did not take away from the fact that she also was very much aware and very critical and very responsive to all the negative things in the world too. But when I, seriously, when I think of Lee, I think of that laugh, which would, would, would cut through cinder blocks and just, it's a, almost like a calling to her. Hmm. Tanya, I think we need to understand that better because how, how can somebody who had so many doors slammed in her face and had so much adversity to have to deal with be so apparently happy and laughing at the joy of the world at the same time? Hmm. It was her strength of spirit, you know, um, she really was strong in who she was as a woman, who she was as a Stolo woman, where she was from. She was grounded in place, grounded in the land, and she was grounded in her language, you know, all of her relations. And she had a wide net of family and friends and everybody who loved her and held her close and whom she held up. As Wab was saying, she always made you feel welcome. She always always included you and she never cut anybody down for um she never gossiped she didn't believe in gossip she never said bad things about anyone really she didn't um she was an incredible person and it's that grounding in who she was that carried her and all her stories. I mean, all her stories came from a sense of place. They came from where she was raised. They came from the water, from the ocean, from the experiences she had as a young woman, especially as a young journalist. She was a journalist too, you know, and when she first got uh, her start, and she pushed her books. Nobody wanted her books. Um, you know, librarians wouldn't stock her books. Her books, some of her early books were banned in um, parts of BC. I mean, she had to have a petition started in order to get published because she was told no one wanted to read books by Indian women. And she's like, 
that's absolutely not true. I'm going to like say, I'm going to push back on that. And I'm going to prove to you that our voices matter and our stories mm. matter and our voices need to be heard. And that is that spirit, that, that love of, of self and all of the people around her and all the things around her. And you could just see it shine through in everything that she did. Well, let's find out how she influenced the three of you in your own writing. I think we need to know some more about that. Uh, Wabgishik, we introduced you off the top as having, I, I guess you're in the midst of working on the sequel to Moon of the Crusted Snow right now. Uh, how did she, I don't want to get too, um, too fancy pants here, but I, I wonder as you're writing the book, <laughs> do you feel her guiding hand with you as you're doing it. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm really just trying to understand it better. Oh, yeah. I think what she did from the beginning of her career was essentially humanize Indigenous people and provide Indigenous realities a venue. And she fought for that. Uh, very passionately, and she stormed doors, as we've mentioned many times. And I think what's always inspired me about her work was that I can connect with people of a Stola background while having these universal Indigenous experiences at the same time, too, right? So for me, you know, uh, working as a journalist before, I, I had great opportunities to convey the realities and experiences of real life people, but I always felt like there was some context that I needed to get to that fiction really provided the opportunity for and and I was inspired by reading Lee Maracle's work and doing that at the same time too there are some really proud moments that she writes about of her background some ceremonial stories um, some really ancient uh, anecdotes of culture and language and really creation um, and we see that in, in a book like Celia's song right it opens in a, such a unique way from a literary perspective that really I think it boldens and empowers someone like me to write about Nishnabe stories in that way. You know, the stories that we've held up that have sustained us and connected us to our culture since time immemorial, right? Like, I feel like I can do that in literature by reading her work. And, you know, it, it's exciting to try to experiment in that sense at the same time. And that's as a result of what Lee has done. Drew, how would she have influenced you as a writer? Well, um... I have done over the years several books of, um, of essays and stories, and my and my sort of attempt to explore indigenous culture. Um, and, and actually, way back in the '90s, I did a, just a book. I, want, I I was really interested in getting the voice of indigenous people in paper and out there. And I did a book called Voices Being Native in Canada, my first attempt at this. And the great and wonderful Lee Miracle. I was talking with her. She submitted a short story for nothing. And I included it in the book. And I think it was one of the best things in a book. And I just remember feeling so honored that she wanted to participate in a project of mine for nothing, just that she supported what I was trying to do and wanted to be a part of it. And then some years later, I am, I'm doing a series of books called Me. Uh, me, uh, uh, me Funny, Me Sexy, Me uh, uh, Artsy, and my most recent one, uh, meet tomorrow. And Lee, um, I, I approached Lee about submitting some stuff to, to one of the books, specifically Me Sexy. And oh my gosh, she approached, she, she delivered me something that was just so outrageously funny, but so true. I'm like reading this, said, you really want to put this out? And she said, yes, it's true. <laughs> And so I just burst out laughing and I included it. So to me, Lee, in terms of how she affected me, she affected me as being completely not afraid of how of, of things you've done and things you, you're doing and things you're going to do. Because um, like one of the things very few people know about Lee that I just think is so cool is back in the late 60s, early 70s, Lee Miracle was a go-go dancer. She wore high boots, short skirt, and danced in a cage. That was one of the many facets of Lee Miracle, and she was not ashamed of it. She would talk about it. It was just a, um, a, a characteristic and, and what she later became. And she owned it up properly, and she would write about it. So when I, when I think about how Lee has affected me, I just think about own your past, own your present, own your future, and don't be afraid to write about it. The only time we ever had into got into any sort of 
disagreement was, as I said, she was an actress and she was in one of my, a uh, couple of my plays, one of them being uh, Someday about um, the scoop up. And there's a line in there where the mother character, the, the daughter returns after being away for 35 years and says that she came in second in school, uh, valedictorian. And the mother says, um, second is good. Uh, but Lee always had problems with that line. We would fight over that line because Lee was such a strong proponent of being first. Not, not, not in herself, but as, as a woman, as an indigenous person going, why settle for second when you can be first? And she said, I, I always urged my kids to be first. And we would get into this line about the character stuff. She did the line as was requested because, you know, she was she was an actress. She knew the whole the whole uh, principle of, uh, of, of of taking on your character. But every time she was in that play, she was in a play about three times, I think. And we always had long discussions <laughs> over a single line. <laughs> Second is good. But she ultimately yielded <laughs> to you on that. Yes, she was a professional. Above all, Lee Merrifield was a professional. Gotcha. Tanya, uh, true or false, I've heard this story about you that when you were a little kid, you used to steal books off your mother's night table, some of which were hers, and read them mm -hmm. kind of in secret. Yes? That's true. That's true. <laughs> I, um, I wrote about that as well in a piece I wrote on Lee. Um, Half Breed by Maria Campbell was one of those books, and um, In Search of April Raintree was another one. And this was in the you know late seventies, early eighties. And I I was a voracious reader as a girl. I still am, and I was reading everything. And these were books that I found you know kind of like my mom's books that you're not supposed to touch, right, and that are all beside the bed or underneath the bed. And these were the books and um, Lee's books. Later, I Am Woman, um, you know, she taught me about my own voice. And she taught me, before I knew her, she taught me about the validity of our voices as Indigenous women and that our stories are just as strong as anyone else's, if not stronger, because we speak from a different place. We speak from the land, from our communities. You know, we're life givers, we're water carriers. And all of the things that she said and wrote about made me feel like I belonged. And when, um, getting back to your other question too, um, you know, how she influenced me when I started to write All Our Relations before I started to write, I sat with her and I asked her, you know, I, I just had this big sort of roundabout conversation about, you know, I'm writing this book on why it is our children are taking their lives, but it's much more than that. This is a book about, um, about genocide. It's a book about what's happened in all of these nations that have um, been colonized, uh, indigenous nations, and how do I move forward? What do I do with this book? And so we had this massive talk about belonging, and she really turned my head around to where I needed to go with the book. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned her in my acknowledgments, like right off the top. And um, I'll, I'll never forget sitting with her for hours talking about how to form that book. And I feel so incredibly lucky that I've had that experience and her her guiding hand and not just there too. <clears throat> you know, I know that uh, Wab and Drew have also had these experiences of traveling with her, of being with her at conferences, um, you know, when we're all together and the lessons that she gave me then, you know, from hours in the car or just sitting with her and, you know, telling me not to take any crap and to, to make sure I take care of myself. <laughs> and she's like, where's your medallion? She goes, you're hearing it's like one of the things she said to me, so you're hearing so many stories and as a journalist too, and as a person who, who writes and speaks about all of these things, she goes, you need to be wearing a medallion on you all the time right here. So you're protecting yourself. Um, she was very much into holistically um, how we take care of ourselves as Indigenous people too, because we have been here in this place that has tried to destroy our families and ourselves for so long. And taking care of ourselves and rising and raising up others was at her heart. Um, and I, I'm grateful for those lessons, always those lessons. And Drew, you're so right in the laughter. You know, when I heard that she passed, I swear I could hear her in my mind, you know, just so clear her voices and just thinking about all those moments we had together. And I always I can hear her laugh right now, just just in your head. Right. <laughs> it's um, 
It's something. And, and, you know, so one of the things she said was that sound is always present with us, right? Sound travels and no, no word is lost. No sound is lost. And that gives me a little bit of comfort knowing that her laughter is still with us. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, Gishik, I want to take us back to the middle 1970s when she tried to get her first novel, Bobby Lee, Indian Rebel, published. I presume over the years you've had conversations with her about the difficulty of trying to convince the Canadian literary establishment of 45 years ago to publish a female Indigenous author. Uh, put some flesh on that bone for us. What was that like for her? Yes, I've heard her tell this story uh, a few times, and she basically was having doors shut in her face when she advocated for herself and her story uh, by the literary establishment here in Canada. And uh, I believe she went out and petitioned people uh, in Vancouver show potential publishers that there was an audience for her story. And I think at the time, um, a bestseller in Canada was considered something that would sell 3,500 copies or something like that. And Tanya or Drew may know the details of this more uh, better than I do, and they can fill in the blanks if so. Uh, but anyway, she went and got all these names, all these people that will read your book if it's published. And then she took it to the publisher, and, and I believe that's how the ball got rolling. But there's a, another interesting anecdote she always shared with that story, and it was that she would go to Indigenous people um, in downtown Vancouver at the time, um, and what she discovered was that a lot of them um, couldn't read, uh, despite, you know, being adults, uh, despite being in Canada. Um, they didn't receive proper education while in residential school, so she was sort of unpacked Packing these truths about our history while trying to chart her own literary course, right? And that's just sort of the revolutionary way that she approached not just her, her own path and her own stories, but also uncovering the ugly realities of this country by exposing what exactly it has done to, you know, her fellow Indigenous people. And then uh, there's another story about how she uh, basically took to the stage at uh, the Vancouver Writers Festival, I believe that was sometime in, in the late 80s, um, because they hadn't actually invited her to, to share her most recent book there, right? So, um, yeah, it was very much claiming her space. And as a result, you know, people like us can take up that space nowadays. Well, Drew, let me get you to comment on a comment that she made a couple of years ago when talking about this time of her life. She said, I think we were afraid to pick our bundles up in the 70s. we just come out of residential school, boarding school, and we were afraid of our own cultures. We were afraid of our own languages, afraid of our own stories. It was like a revolution. Explain that to us if you would. How was it like a revolution? Well, I think a lot of it also has to do with um, the current issue concerning what are so-called pretendians, right? For so long, our culture, our language, all of this had been uh, basically uh, they tried to destroy it. And now we are picking it up. We're coming back. And one of the things with pretendians we have a problem with is other people are embracing getting strong with our stories and our voice. Now, Lee was of that first generation. There was her. There was... Um, uh, Maria Campbell, Jeanette Armstrong. I, I, oddly enough, it was the women who picked up those bundles, who picked up that voice, went out, got their stories published, got their stories out there that paved the way for us. So I think it was just it's uh, it was just her way of um, paving the path for the the later generations. I think Lee Lee just, was just fear, fearless. She was just fearless, and she felt that part of the healing of the culture, of all the, the various Indigenous cultures in this country, the healing came from the stories that had to be told. We are going, I think, Tanya, through a kind of uh, Indigenous renaissance right now. Uh, we, we started, actually, to make a list of the major literary awards uh, that Indigenous authors have won over the last uh, several years. And... Um, well, you know, we're not going to put the list out here because it would take up all the time that we've got left to chat. Um, how, how much credit do you think she can take for the renaissance we're seeing today in Indigenous writing? Hmm. I appreciate that question. I'm going to say to you that it is not a renaissance. We've always been here and people are just listening now to our stories. I, I think that that's what she would probably answer to that to that as well. That's a better you way know. to put it. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, that we are the original storytellers of this land. 
And, you know, I don't think that Canada really understands the mark that she made on this land and in this place um, and setting the, the table for the rest of us and the, the entire country, too. I mean, um, she sets out to try and explain to Canadians in conversations with Canadians, her, her book that she did a couple of years ago, um, all the questions that people are always asking her and are always asking all of us, you know, questions about um, labor law, um, segregation, questions about assimilation, questions about why is this happened in this land? You know, how could this possibly happen? And, um, and Canada never understood her. You know, it's true. She had to storm a stage in order to get invited to, well, she wasn't invited to the Vancouver Writers Festival. She had to put herself out there and she really did. And we all owe her so much to that. Um, before that, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for her storming the doors, if it wasn't for Maria Campbell telling the stories of, of the women, of who we are. And I think that it made me sad, you know, um, that Canada never really did appreciate her as um, as she was she was aging and getting older. And that, you know, I wrote about this and it's so true. There we were um, to interview Maria Campbell. This is a, a memory that I had a couple um, mm. couple years mm. ago um, from, it was a Facebook memory. Um, there we were um, to talk to Maria Campbell, Lee Miracle and myself. And we were in um, another story bookshop and I kept thinking to myself that these are literary matriarchs. These are giants. And we should be in Massey Hall. We should be in a theater that seats a thousand, two thousand people. And, you know, the, the glory that these women, the strength that these women have brought us, the understanding to this entire country, hasn't been fully realized by Canada. Hmm. And um, I, hmm. I hope that, that everyone sees what she has done and all of the work she's done to uplift and to create space and understanding for everyone on this land. Well, maybe this is a good opportunity mm -hmm. to have each of you. I tell you, one of the reasons we're doing this program is that while she had a profound influence on the three of you, there are still plenty of people in Canada who haven't read her work, who don't know of her story. And, and we wanted to do a program on hers in part, I think, to mm -hmm. give you three an opportunity to point those who are watching or listening to this to just one, one piece of her work that somebody should go to the library and pick up or go to a bookshop and pick up. Uh, okay, Wob, start us off here. What's one thing somebody should read of Lee's that would give them a real good sense of who she was? I already mentioned it, but I would have to say Celia Song, her most recent novel. Uh, I believe it, you know, represents not necessarily the pinnacle of what she tried to do, but at that point in her career, I believe she was more proudly able to uh, advocate for her story and her culture in that book. And I think um, that is inspiring for other Indigenous authors, but it also can provide a glimpse for non-Indigenous Canadians into what uh, the nuances of our cultures actually are as Indigenous people. Um, and, and again, the opening is just so profound and impressive that uh, it'd grip pretty much any reader. So I, I would say Celia Song. Then. All right. There's one vote for Celia Song. Drew, what are you following up with? Um, well, first, I'd like to point out that I have right here in front of me an original edition of wow. Bobby Lee Indian Rebel that belongs to my partner. And uh, it it's just got, like, look at a very young Lee Miracle. Hmm. <laughs> cool. Anyways, um, I'd have to be, I'm going to be a little self-serving and say the essay she did for me sexy because you get to see her storytelling technique you get to see her sense of humor her her salacious side and the essay she did for that book talking talking about indigenous sexuality was then um picked up and ran in another anthology somewhere but let me put it this way they had to edit it they took out some of the funner juicier parts so if you want the funny funnier, juicier parts of, uh, of Lee Miracle's uh, essay on Indigenous sexuality. You have to go to Me Sexy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got um, one Celia song. We got a, a Bobby Lee. We're going to put Bobby Lee on the list, too. We're going to put Me Sexy there. And Tanya, you're batting cleanup here. What's left? I am woman. 
It was first published in 1988, and uh, almost 40 years later, it round, it wound up on the short list, or actually the long list for Canada Reads. And it's uh, it's a book uh, about the consequences of colonialism on uh, Indigenous women. And I, I think that that book was way ahead of its time. I mean, everything she did was... <laughs> She saw, she just knew, and I would encourage all, all women, especially Indigenous women, to, to read I Am Woman. It's, uh, it's formidable. I love it. Good. We got some good recommendations there. Let's, um, in our remaining moments here, let's, let's give her the last word. This is a quote from her 2018 essay called Scent of Burning Cedar, and it goes like this. I write because I cannot fall silent into a backwash of Canadiana after having produced 15,000 years of story. I write because I want our youth to know that we have value, we have knowledge, and we have a place in this world. The place we have was carved for us by our ancestors who loved us so much that they died that we might live. Okay, that's why she writes. Let me get a minute from each of you on why you write. Wob, start us off. Well, I write because of her. I write because of Drew and Tanya. I am inspired and honored just to be uh, amongst them as peers. Uh, I write because of my community, and I write for the people who have never had the opportunity to convey their realities and their truths. Uh, it's a big responsibility. I take it very seriously, but ultimately, I have the utmost respect for my people, my culture, my <clears throat> nation, and more widely, Indigenous people. So, Great. That's Drew, me. what do you say? Uh, well, I have no other serviceable talent, so I became a writer. Um, <laughs> that's 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 the the facetious line. But basically, one of the things about being a writer that I really like is you have more control over the world you create than the world you live in, and I really like that. I see myself as being a contemporary storyteller. In this world, there's so many stories to tell, um, and I'm just I'm just uh, I haven't even scratched the surface yet, and. Uh, I think it was Tom King who once said, "All we are, our stories are. That's all we are." And I'm, I try to imagine a world without stories, and that scares me. Tanya, you get the last thirty. Hmm. I write for all of the reasons that you just heard, um, and I, I write nonfiction, so it's it's a little bit different. Um, I write. If, I write for equity for our people. I believe that our stories will lead us forward and our stories are, as you said, Drew, as Tom said, they are what we have. They are all we have. And we've had them for thousands of years. And I think that our stories are gonna lead us forward as a people. And I write for my people, my communities. I write for my family. I write for those that didn't get to be heard and that are still out there needing to be heard. And um, I, I write thinking about Lee, too. Our sincere thanks to Tanya Talega in Toronto, Drew Hayden Taylor in Toronto, Wabgishik Rice in Sudbury for joining us to look at the literary legacy of Lee Miracle. Thanks so much, you three. Chi miigwech. 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 Thank you very much. meeting is scheduled to take place at the Vatican among First Nation, Inuit and Métis delegates, as well as Canadian Catholic bishops, church officials and ultimately Pope Francis. The impetus for this gathering is to address the legacy of Canada's residential school system and how the Catholic Church can make amends. Phil Fontaine is a former national chief of the Assembly of First Nations. He will be a member of that delegation and he joins us now from Calgary, Alberta. Phil Fontaine, it's good to see you again. How are you doing? I'm, I'm well, thank you. Glad to hear it. You are part of, as we suggest, this delegation that's going to be having four days of talks at the Vatican with church leaders. What's on your agenda as you head towards those meetings? I think we have a, a, a common agenda. Uh, there are 13 official delegates for the Assembly of First Nations, and uh, we're following, all 13 are following the same script. And uh, uppermost in our minds, of course, is uh, an apology from the Pope and a, a, a commitment uh, to visit uh, Canada uh, soon. 
And uh, as you know, this announcement uh, was previously made by the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. And so those are two very important issues, but there are also uh, other matters that are uh, of critical importance to us. Uh, access to records, uh, the issue of unmarked graves, uh, the doctrine of discovery and setting that aside forever. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, make the point that uh, we're, of course, uh, uh, also focused on the, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the, the 94 calls to action and the 10 principles of, uh, of uh, reconciliation. Right. Now, you, this will not be your first audience with a pope. You had one previously back in 2009. And I wonder what you think uh, will be different this time from last time. Well, there, there are differences uh, from two, 2009 to, to this one. Uh, the discussions leading up to the private audience with Benedict XVI uh, were uh, discrete conversations with the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops and uh, the, uh, the Vatican. And leading up to the private audience, we had already had the uh, Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, the historic agreement, and the apology in the House of Commons from uh, Prime Minister Harper. So that, that played into uh, the, the invitation from the Vatican to uh, meet with Benedict XVI in a private audience. This time, much of what has transpired has been uh, public. Uh, the discussions with the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Assembly of First Nations, the Métis National Council, and the uh, ITK. And as well, and this is really important, we, we didn't have the TRC then, 94 calls to action. This has been central to all of the conversations between the Catholic Church and, and, and our community. And uh, we didn't have the situation with on Mark Graves, uh, we, we weren't uh, being stalled by uh, uh, governments, I mean, not the government, but the church's reluctance to, uh, to uh, uh, allow us access to all of the records they have here in Canada, but as well, importantly, records they have in the uh, archives in the Vatican. Hmm. I want to read you and, and pick up on the uh, comment you just made about the unmarked graves because when Pope Francis first heard about this at the Kamloops Indian Residential School earlier this year, here's part of what he had to say. With sorrow, he said, I follow the news from Canada about the shocking discovery of the remains of 215 children, pupils at the Kamloops Indian Residential School in the province of British Columbia. I join the Canadian bishops and the whole Catholic Church in Canada in expressing my closeness to the Canadian people who have been traumatized by this shocking news. This sad discovery further heightens awareness of the pain and sufferings of the past. May the political and religious authorities in Canada continue to work together with determination to shed light on this sad event and humbly commit themselves to a path of healing and reconciliation. Now, having heard those comments, what do you think that portends for you? Well, that certainly wasn't uh, an invitation to, uh, to visit uh, the Pope in, in Rome. Uh, neither did it uh, uh, speak directly to the issue of an apology. And, uh, and so things have changed. Uh, incredible pressure from different quarters in Canadian society, uh, pressing the, the Catholic Church, the Pope in particular, to apologize so that all Canadians can begin the process of reconciliation. As reconciliation isn't just about us, the survivors. It's really a Canadian issue, and the apology would do uh, sig uh, would be very significantly important to get that process uh, underway in a in a real way. Mr. Fontaine, I know you have talked about this before, so apologies for making you go down a road that uh, is well traveled by you. But I know there will be people watching and listening right now who don't know that when you talk about residential schools, this is a very personal story for you. How old were you when you first attended a residential school? I was six when I entered, and I spent 10 years in two schools. 
Where were those schools? Where were those schools? One uh, located on the reserve that I'm from, Sagging. It was called the Fort Alexander Union Residential School, and another in Winnipeg called the Assiniboia High School. Did your parents have the option of sending you there? No, gosh, no. They didn't. They were they themselves had been students at the residential school, all my older siblings. Our grandmother on my father's side had been a student at the St. Boniface Industrial School. And uh, no, there was little or no choice. In fact, my my parents uh, removed uh, my, my brothers from the residential school for one year in protest for the treatment at the, sco at the school. Eventually, they all returned and uh, I had my turn when I when I was six, uh, and uh, my life for the next ten years was about residential school. Do I infer from the name of those schools that they were run by the Catholic Church? They were run by the uh, Oblate Fathers and Oblate Sisters in Fort Alexander, Oblate Fathers and Grey Nuns in Winnipeg. When you spoke to Pope Benedict back in 2009, did you raise? your own personal experiences at residential schools with him? No, God, no, no, I didn't. It was uh, more a, a, a general statement about the experience of the, uh, that, that was shared by many thousands of, uh, of First Nations and other Indigenous peoples in residential schools and industrial schools. And what that meant uh, to our people, uh, and the consequence is that we have been forced to live all these many years because the church up until that point had refused to acknowledge, at least through an apology, very importantly, uh, that they were um, very directly responsible for what had transpired. Keeping in mind that they didn't operate all the schools, but the largest percentage of Indian residential schools were operated by various Catholic orders in Canada. And when you put that information to him, what was his, what do you recall his reaction being? I thought he was sincere in his response to the statement that I had delivered to him. And he expressed uh, sincere regrets for the abuse that had been inflicted on, on children. And that, and he made the point very clearly that there was no place in the Catholic Church for such uh, uh, abuse. But he did not, if I recall this properly, he did not offer a formal apology. And I wonder what in your mind do you think has prohibited the Church from offering that apology that has been so sought after? You're right, there, he, he didn't apologize. But I wasn't going to leave the Vatican uh, in despair because I believe that the uh, 2009 private audience with Benedict XVI, and given all of what has transpired since then, has led to this invitation from uh, the, the Vatican and the Holy Father to visit uh, in the next few days. And uh, I think uh, that's critically important. Um, where we take it from, from there, I mean, that's, that's the important challenge that faces us. Because the apology is one thing. Um, um, it's really important. Um, the visit by the Holy Father to Canada is very important. If he combines the two, that would be, I think, uh, monumental. And if, and if he apologizes, apologizes when we're in Rome, wonderful. But I would suggest that when he comes to Canada, he would reaffirm that apology. Uh, on our lands, somewhere in Canada, in for example, in Kamloops, where with 215 unmarked graves in uh, uh, Wanuskewa in Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, and other places, uh, the tour has to be focused on first on First Nations lands, Métis territories, and Inuit uh, communities. Hmm. Uh, let's go back to first principles here for a second, because whenever a formal for example, a, an apology from a government comes forward, as the government of Canada did for Japanese Canadians interned during World War II. 
You know, there are people who say, look, this happened a long time ago. What's the value in these apologies? Do they really mean all that much at the end of the day? What's your response to that? Well, it's true. It happened a long time ago, but we still suffer the consequences. And uh, we're not the only people that suffer. All Canadians suffer. And, uh, and the, the point here is, for example, most Canadians were not aware of the residential school experience. It's the, the issue of unmarked graves seems to, seem to grab the attention of all Canadians. So the point here is, the apology is yes to the people that attended residential schools, the survivors, but reconciliation is about all Canadians. And the apology will make it possible for all Canadians to join with us on a journey of reconciliation that has been described as a hill that we all have to climb. And uh, we need all of the support we, uh, uh, that is possible. And there could be no greater expression than to have uh, Pope Francis clearly uh, articulate an apology to, to our people. Yes, and a commitment to reconciliation. I hear you. Let, let's clarify that while the Pope himself has not offered a formal apology, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, bishops did apologize a couple of months ago. Uh, and I just want to read an excerpt here from the Globe and Mail. This is from investigative reporter Tom Cardo Cardozo, who wrote the following. As part of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement reached in 2006, Christian denominations responsible for operating Canada's residential schools agreed to pay restitution. The Catholic Church, which operated roughly 60% of residential schools, had the largest set of financial commitments. Those included a $29 million cash payment, 80% of which was to go to the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, an Indigenous-led national organization. $25 million of in-kind services provided by the church, and an additional $25 million in a, quote, best efforts national fundraising campaign. But according to the government's court submissions, church officials violated the terms of the settlement agreement by reallocating funds meant for reconciliation and healing. Ottawa's court filings called the move shocking and argued that Catholic officials had, quote, taken a novel approach to accounting. Okay, you were, uh, I think you led the team that was in, involved in that 2006 settlement, the negotiations there. Uh, where is this at today? Well, the, the most recent uh, commitment by the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops is, uh, is to raise $30 million over five years. The fund will then be transferred to an, an Indigenous organization that would then so, uh, proceed to support uh, uh, Indigenous-led uh, initiatives and programs to deal with healing. And uh, the other uh, three outstanding issues, I think that that's a matter of, uh, of uh, that's a matter between the government, the courts, and the Catholic Church entities in Canada. And so, the, you asked me earlier about the apology and why there seemed to be a reluctance. I think the the issue all along has been about liability. But that was addressed in the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. Other than these three outstanding uh, issues that are, uh, that are uh, outlined in the Globe and Mail article. Uh, but in a, uh, since, of course, we have the $30 million commitment by the uh, CCCB, and uh, we'll see how successful they are. Uh, my, what makes me uh, optimistic is that uh, it's the congregations themselves, Catholic Church congregations, that have been really strong on pressing uh, the church leaders to do the right thing, which is to convince the Pope to, to apologize, come to Canada for a papal tour, visit uh, certain First Nation communities that I've already noted, and uh, figure out together next steps, because there are a whole number of things that we, we, we still have to do to, to make things better. We shouldn't overlook the fact that 
the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, has been involved in discussions with the three national indigenous organizations for the last few years about this visit to uh, to, to the Vatican, and uh, including going as far as drafting a statement that would be uh, part of a, an apology by the Pope. But the pandemic uh, uh, happened, and all of those discussions uh, were uh, set to the side, set aside. All of a sudden, uh, we heard that we were being invited to Rome. And then, during the course of our discussions, and I'm, here I'm referring to preparatory discussion for the visit, we, we learned that the Pope had committed to coming to Canada. Now, I'm going to circle back to a previous answer that you gave, because it's not only the formal apology you would like, it's also releasing all the records that you referenced earlier. Uh, where are things at in terms of the release of records from the Vatican uh, to getting at the eventual truth of what happened? Well, some dioceses have, have released records. For example, the Archdiocese of St. Boniface has provided me and others with a number of documents related to the industrial school that was uh, situated uh, in St. Boniface. And these are good records. I've, I've had a chance to review the records. I think they're very, very helpful in terms of identifying the students that attended the industrial school, those that died, and the cause of, of death, and where they are buried. And they're all, those that uh, died at the industrial school are buried at the old uh, graveyard at the cathedral in St. Boniface. But they're essentially unmarked graves because no one knows where these uh, people are buried. I mean, we're talking here about 6,000 people that uh, one would consider on Mark Graves. And, and these are not just uh, the kids that died at the industrial school. So uh, really very important that we have access, full access to these records. And we understand that there are a whole, uh, uh, all kinds of records at the, at the, uh, at the Vatican archives, the secret uh, archives as they, they've been called. And uh, there are discussions ongoing that may result in, in the Vatican opening up these ar archives for researchers. The other thing I wanted to mention, uh, I, I, I don't want to forget this, uh, Steve, mm -hmm. is that the church at their museum in Rome has a number of, uh, of uh, artifacts and exhibits, uh, indigenous artifacts and exhibits. Uh, we've been reading about a kayak, uh, an Inuit kayak. I saw that kayak when, when, I, when I was given a tour of the Vatican, and I saw uh, magnificent uh, pieces of artwork, masts, and uh, mucklucks, and, uh, and what have you, that are contained and have been held there at the Vatican Museum for years and years and years. I think we should uh, begin discussions with the Vatican and church authorities in figuring out how we can have those uh, 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 artifacts returned to the rightful owners, and that is our people here in Canada. Uh, Mr. Fontaine, this may be a bit of an odd question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You've been through a lot. Um, indigenous people in this country have been through a lot. Do you forgive them for what they did? If there's an apology, I think there has to be forgiveness on our side. I mean, for example, the Oblates uh, apologized in 1969, other denominations did. And uh, if it's a sincere, truthful apology, absolutely we should uh, accept the apology and we should forgive. Otherwise, we will never achieve true reconciliation. We can go through, our, through, all, through all of our lives angry and uh, bitter and uh, unforgiving. I think, uh, I think we, we must be strong enough, uh, strong enough to, to forgive. Uh, and uh, yes, I, I, uh, it, it's too much of a burden to carry forever. But, and, but it has uh, to start with an apology from them, in your view. Oh, gosh, that, that's, uh, that's an argument that's been made uh, over time. And I believe in ex 
it's an importance. But there have been there's been important work that's been going on for a number of years now between the various Catholic Church entities and our people, and that goes for the other denominations that uh, are designed to bring about uh, uh, reconciliation, that are about bringing out the truth, and uh, these are really positive uh, indications of a commitment on the part of the various denominations, including the Catholic Church, to, to learn from their mistakes and, uh, and not to repeat those mistakes. Okay. Are there any guarantees in that regard? I don't think anyone can make that kind of guarantee. Mm -hmm. But we can uh, express goodwill and good faith and a commitment to, to do the right thing. And just finally, how will you judge or determine whether the apology, if it comes, is in fact sincere? Well, that'll be up to each individual. I want to hear the words uh, clearly spell, uh, that clearly spells out the apology. And uh, if that is what uh, we are offered, then, uh, then this becomes an incredible uh, achievement. It's a wonderful moment for, for all of us. And uh, it, should, it should be welcomed, not just by us, the official delegates, but our community, and in fact, Canadians. Uh, the point I made earlier, reconciliation is, uh, is all about uh, Canadians, all Canadians. And sh so uh, if we say yes, this was a sincere apology, then uh, we should be able to uh, get on with the work of uh, reconciliation. Well, good luck with your meetings, and thanks for coming on to TVO tonight and talking to us about it. Phil Fontaine, the former National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Good to be with you tonight, Mr. Fontaine. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. Tomorrow, we'll learn about some efforts to revitalize rural parts of Ontario and why it's not always as straightforward as might be expected. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow.